there's an interesting effect um, that we can observe that actually complicates the proton NMR spectrum quite a bit, and it's called splitting and multiplicity. It's just one of these things in chemistry that's really interesting, but can be kind of complicated. We actually figured out how to turn off splitting and multiplicity, um, a technique called decoupling, but it turned out that it's actually fairly useful, definitely so when trying to determine the structure of a molecule using proton NMR spectroscopy. And, and it actually really allows proton NMR spectroscopy to be sort of the, um, to be sort of the best uh, spectroscopic method for determining the structure of small molecules. I mean, it's great when we just have everything and we can pull together all the data, but if you have to get one piece of data, proton NMR is, is uh, very quick to obtain and acquire data for, and um, you get so much data compared to all of the other one-dimensional uh, techniques. Okay, so here's what sort of happens. I'll set this up and then we'll get into the practical aspects of it. But what happens is, is that neighboring nuclei can, like electrons, um, can also shield slash de-shield the 1H atom <clears throat> being studied. Okay, so um, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, because what that means is that we, we not only feel the effect of shielding and deshielding to shift the nucleus from one, um, from one position to another, but uh, by electrons, we also feel this from nuclei, full-blown nuclei. Um, and I guess maybe it, it shouldn't be so surprising, but what I'm saying here is, uh, so, so maybe what I'm saying here isn't entirely new, but what's interesting is the spin or excuse me, the magnetic state, whether we're in the alpha state or the beta state, will also have a subtle effect. So the alpha and beta state of the neighboring nucleus will also influence the position. Okay, so whether or not a nucleus is in the alpha state or the beta state is going to shift the, um, the frequency of absorption a little bit to one side or another side within the spectrum. So we can go this way or this way, depending on whether or not we're in the alpha state. And don't worry about which state will do, um, will shift which way or the other way. The thing I wanna remind you of is that we need to recall that half, one half, of the, whoops, goodness, com combining words, of the nuclei, worst F ever. Okay, one half of the nuclei are in the alpha state and one half are in the beta state. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that if an alpha state shifts our nucleus over here, the beta state is going to shift it over here. So what we get is we have this one signal, this one signal corresponding to one chemical environment, but based on if it has there, if there's a neighbor nearby, what we have is an alpha state of the neighbor doing this and a beta state of the neighbor doing this. If that neighbor wasn't there, we'd be right here right in the middle between those two, I guess, peaks. But instead what we get is half over here and half over here. This is called peak splitting. Okay, so we actually split a signal into multiple kind of peaks, I guess. So in splitting, this results in a split peak, what we call a doublet. Let's draw this with pictures. Sorry, I was probably too quick there. Um, what I'm gonna do is show you a signal and then I'm gonna show you what the effect is if you, if you go one half alpha and then one half beta, okay? So what we have here is just some PPM value of a signal. 
This is just one chemical environment, let's call it HA. And then if we have one times a neighboring hydrogen, what we get is we get splitting. Maybe we were originally, and I'm gonna do take advantage of technology here for a second. Let's paste this. So maybe we had this drawing originally, but what we're going to see now is we're going to see the peak now, and actually it's going to be about half the height. Let's do a lot of undoing here. But if we're going to be this precise, let's get it right. So we're actually going to see the split peak looks like this. So the split peak. And we call that peak a doublet. Well, at the outset, this kind of complicates um, our NMR spectra quite a bit because what that means is that means that we could have examples where a situation like this A situation where we see this, and this is just some NMR signal, this is one signal that has been split into multiple peaks. Okay, so how can we tell the difference between a peak that um, um, a peak being a signal or a bunch of peaks being one signal. Like, how do we know if we see a bunch of peaks, how do I know in this picture, let's focus on this picture. How do I know that those two peaks don't correspond to two signals? Okay, well, what we can do is kind of focus on the spacing. So the above is an example. I don't need to write above, I have an arrow to it. This is an example of a doublet, a peak, excuse me, a signal split into two peaks. Into two peaks due to one neighboring one H atom. Okay, now how does this work? Let's actually start to, to consider this in a little bit more detail. Okay, it turns out that when one H atoms are dot dot dot, or let's put it this way, have one neighboring H atoms, two to three bonds away. And that should be, that's something to kind of make note of. Two to three bonds away. What we'll see, um, and the neighboring H atoms are in different chemical environments. The neighboring H atoms are in different chemical environments. What we'll see is that the signal will be split for every time or for every neighboring H atom. The signal will be split for every neighboring H atom. So this is kind of multiplicity um, in the simplest uh, kind of set of words. That is, 
how do we understand multiplicity? Will we say that what we focus on is that for our atom of interest, if we see neighboring hydrogens two to three bonds away, and those neighboring hydrogens are in different chemical environments, we will see splitting occur. What does that mean? That means the signal will be split for every neighboring hydrogen atom that is present. Let's go right into an example, and I'm going to need more space. So let's consider this molecule. I'm going to go right out and just kind of draw the H atoms. While I'm drawing this, kind of see what I'm doing. Maybe I should just stop talking. And then there's an H atom in the center. It turns out that this molecule has two chemical environments that hydrogen atoms can reside in. There's an HA chemical environment corresponding to the methyl groups, to the CH3 groups, and then there's an HB chemical environment corresponding to that hydrogen in the middle. So what we say is that we have two signals. I should qualify that as one H um, signals. Turns out we also have two um, C13 signals, but let's kind of talk about what we know. We have two signals. The integration is HA is nine, HB is one. A nice little example. So what does, what or how about what is the multiplicity of HA? Well, multiplicity is the term that refers to how much is it split? How much is 8A split? And so we're going to use the actual technical term for the signal. So HA has one neighbor two to three bonds away that is not HA. Okay, now I'm going to highlight. So first of all, let's just do this in red. One bond, two bonds. HA, all of the HAs are two bonds away from two HAs. But I had to add as part of the definition of a hydrogen atom that causes splitting, I had to add for this reason, the fact that the hydrogens must be in different chemical environments. Okay, so we're gonna go from HA down to one bond, two bond, whoop, one bond, two bonds, three bonds. You want me to count those? One, two, three. Basically, the neighboring carbon atom is a really good reference guide. The same carbon if they're different, but most of the time hydrogens attached to the same carbon are in the same chemical environment. So we don't count them as contributing to splitting or multiplicity, okay? So we're gonna count three bonds away. That basically just means, hey, if my hydrogen is on a carbon, how many hydrogens are on the carbon next door, on the adjacent carbon? So this would be an example of an adjacent hydrogen. But the NMR spectroscopists really like to count bonds. They would call this three bond splitting. Okay, every HA, all nine of them, all of them that build up into that signal that's nine hydrogens tall has one neighbor that's in a different chemical environment, that's HB. So we would say that HA is a doublet. A doublet is a signal with two peaks. A signal with two peaks. And it looks like this. Whenever splitting occurs, we form a symmetric looking shape. Our signal is symmetric, which is a good indication that even though we see a bunch of peaks, they correspond to the same signal because it's symmetric. Two peaks with symmetry. 
one is shifted slightly higher, one is shifted slightly lower because half of HB is in the alpha state and half of HB is in the beta state, okay? Now the true chemical shift is always in the middle of this. I feel like I want this gray color here. This is the true chemical shift value. That's an important point. I think I'm going to turn the page and kind of define that. That is to say, the chemical shift of a multiplet, look at this, embedding definitions within, defini within important topics. A multiplet, which is a signal split into multiple peaks A signal split into multiple peaks, that's what a multiplet is. But anyway, the chemical shift of a multiplet is always the center of the multiplet. Uh, well, it is. It is always. It's true. It's just sometimes we can't really tell what the multiplet is or it's overlapping with some other stuff and making a giant blob. Then we have to take the range of the peaks. Like we have to start from the leftmost to the rightmost part of the blob. But if we can resolve all the little peaks, which we can for a lot of multiplets, especially those separated from the other hydrogens within the molecule, what we can do then is actually go right to the center and that will define the chemical shift. I want to take a second to talk about another definition, and that is the coupling constant. So the coupling constant, and we'll go over what this word coupling is, but it's related to multiplicity. The coupling constant is labeled J, and this is the distance between any two neighboring peaks in a multiplet. It's not a difficult concept. It's just difficult to see why it's useful. And we'll have to get a little bit better um, at that when the time uh, comes. And so what I'm saying here is that for our signal for HA, which was a doublet, the coupling constant is this distance here. If we add more peaks, which we'll show in a little bit, it's the distance between any two of the neighboring peaks. And while coupling may be vague, the word constant should be, um, uh, you know, a clear word, right? Constant means unchanging. And what that's saying is the distance between any two peaks within a multiplet should be constant unless there are multiple coupling constants. And that, that gets a little bit um, into uh, some more advanced topics. We can talk about that later as we look into more advanced multiplets um, if we decide to. But anyway, that's the coupling constant, which is the distance between the two peaks. The chemical shift is defined as the middlemost part of the multiplet. What's interesting about the chemical shift is if I highlight, and I'm just gonna label it as delta here, I'm not gonna highlight, just put a delta, is there's not actually a peak there. It's just there would be, if we turned coupling off, there was no alpha state, beta state to cause a shifting, we would see them coalesce on top of each other to give a taller peak that's by itself. Um, so just kind of a, a peak by itself, we actually call that a singlet. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but that's what we would see if we took this, uh, if we took this coupling effect and sort of turned it off. So we define the chemical shift as the middlemost part. Now back to our molecule, what about H, B. The molecule was this, where HB was sort of sticking out in the middle. 
HB has nine neighbors in different chemical environments. Wait, but all of the other nine hydrogens are HAs. We went over that, right? We said HA here, and then there's three of them per carbon. There's three carbons, three times three is nine. Okay, so they're all in the same chemical environment, but the, the key thing is that it's a different chemical environment than that of um, HB. So how many times is it being split? Well, what we have to recall is that each neighbor splits the peak. Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean we split into nine peaks? Well, no, we started with one. So we're actually going to be split into uh, nine plus one. Nine is the number of neighboring H atoms. Okay, nine plus one, which is equal to 10. Yikes, what does that 10, what does a signal look like with 10 peaks? Okay, this is a really tough one to draw and not one that you'll have to draw often, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. So I'm gonna turn the over here. So a um, the signal for HB has 10 peaks. All right, what does that look like? Well, what we have here is going, we have one, two, which is, oh, two, gosh, Wait, come on, pencil. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, come on, seriously. One, two, three, four, five. And then the right side has to be the same, five, four, three, two, one. Don't lose, oh, good, oh, gosh, I don't know. This app has other, otherwise been flawless to me. So what we have here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten peaks. Okay, so maybe ten peaks feels okay because we just added one to nine. And we saw that we had nine hydrogen atoms around that HB. But why are they different heights? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but let's just identify a few things. So the distance between any two peaks, that's J, which is the coupling constant. I just happened to pick those two peaks. The two peaks do have to be right next door. If you went from, so I picked seven to eight. If you went from five to six, that would be a coupling constant distance. Three and four, that would be a coupling constant distance. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so they're all difference between any two next door to each other are a coupling constant. But if I spread it out, if I went from like one to five, that's not the coupling constant for this particular signal. Now, the other attribute of this multiplet, signal split into multiple peaks, is that between the um, right in the middle, which sometimes there will be a peak, sometimes not, this is delta, the chemical shift. Okay. So what we see here is that we have two signals. One was a doublet, a signal with two peaks. The other one was a signal with 10 peaks, maybe a, a deck at or something. Um, just really complicated. But that in combination with an integration of nine to one, in combination with different chemical shifts, allows us to understand the structure of a molecule. And you'll get a better grasp of this when you're actually asked to solve the structure of molecules during lab um, in week two of the course. Okay, so why, let's, let's go through and break down what's sort of happening here. So why are there two or 10 peaks? The answer, just getting away from alpha states and beta states, is something called, and that's critically important, the n plus one rule. The n plus one rule says that what you do is you determine the number of neighboring 
uh, let's, let's, yeah, let me say this. We determine the number of neighboring hydrogens that are in different chemical environments, and we just add one to that. So N is the number of neighboring H atoms. So neighboring means two to three bonds, H atoms in different chemical environments. Remember the neighbors can have the same chemical environment. We saw that with HA in our example. But the neighboring, um, but the, the neighboring atoms can't have the same chemical environment as the one that we're looking at. Okay, so we look at this two um, and three bonds away. So HA had has N equal to one. That's one times an HB. There were one, there was one HB atom. Okay, so N is equal to one. That means the number of peaks equals N plus one or one plus one, which is equal to two. All right, so we see two here. Two tells us we should see a two peak multiplet, which is a doublet. Let's do the same thing for HA. I have to turn the page. Doing so, okay. Or for HB um, instead of HA. Okay, so what we see for HB is that HB N equals nine, right? There were nine times HA. What that means is that the number of peaks then that we'll see in the one signal for HB equals n plus one, where n equals nine. So one plus, uh, how about nine plus one, just for parallelism, equals 10 peaks. So it's simply the n plus one rule. So this explains how many peaks that we would expect. Now, what I want to do is look at some common multiplets that we often see in organic chemistry. So we have, whoops, common multiplets. 10 is not that common. It's just a really nice first example. Maybe it's not, but in my view, it's a really nice first example. So common multiplets. And I pick on the ones that are easier to draw. So, We have our two peak, our two peak signal. That's a doublet. Here, n is equal to one because one plus one equals two, telling us we have two peaks. Now we can kind of get that from the word dub from doublet. Now the next one's going to be the triplet. This is going to have three peaks where n is equal to two. Two plus one is equal to three. But I want you to notice the relative ratio of the three peaks. We're going to start and go up and then up twice as high and then down to make the peak symmetric. Okay, so we go one to two to one ratio. One to two to one ratio. That's different from the doublet, which was one to one. All of these are going to be symmetric. Now for number four, we're going to go into the quartet. The little one and actually three to three to one. The quartet here, n is equal to three. Three plus one is four. That gives us four peaks. Now five is sometimes called a quintet or a pentet, I guess. I've gotten used to pentet where n is equal to four. That means you've got five peaks. Now here the ratio is one to four to six to four to one, symmetric still. 
one to four to six to four to one. All right, now in every case, the center of the multiplet is equal to the chemical shift. In the case of the triplet in the pentet, we notice that the chemical shift is now overlapping with the central peak within our multiplet, whereas for the even numbered peaks, uh, peak signals, the chemical shift is actually between two peaks. So the chemical shift is actually defined as something that's not actually a peak, it's just between the two. Okay, so here are four possible multiplets. These are four common multiplets that we will see. Actually, anything bigger than four gets to be a little bit too difficult to dissect in the NMR spectrometer. It can be done. It can be possible to see a hextet um, or a septet or a nonet or an octet or even a decet. But honestly, they start to blur together a little bit and it becomes, it's really useful for quartets, triplets and doublets. That's where it really shines. But are these, as the quartet, the triplet and the doublet, are those the most common, any of those the most common multiplet? Technically, if we call it a multiplet, by far the most common multiplet is when n is equal to zero because it applies for so many other nuclei where we turn off this effect altogether. And if n is equal to zero, we'll see one peak because one peak is what one plus zero is equal to. And we go up to one down, we just have one peak and we call this easy to digest peak a singlet. And we'll just comment here, singlets have no coupling constant. And the chemical shift, like the other odd peaked multiplets, if you call this a multiplet, is right in the center. It's still symmetric. So that is, those are some common um, multiplets. Let's, uh, before we go through a few examples, what I want to do is just ask the, answer the question, why do multiplets have their shapes or their ratios of peaks? Did I just undo too much? Maybe, okay. So, um, why do multiplets have their peak ratios? Well, what happens is if we imagine that if we have n equals zero, we have a singlet. If we have n equals one, we have a doublet. If we have n equals two, we have something like this. Now what's happening here is that an n equals zero, we, um, if we go from n equals zero to n equals one, we have two peaks because n could be alpha or beta. N could be in the alpha state or the beta state, all right? So one of them is going to correspond to when N is in the alpha state. The other one's going to correspond to when N is in the beta state, okay? Now, what we have here is in the, in the triplet, let's look at the outermost, um, the outermost uh, peaks within our multiplet. What we have here is furthest to the left and furthest to the right. These correspond to an alpha alpha for the two neighbors. Now, as opposed to just having one neighbor that could be in its one alpha state or its one beta state, now we have two neighbors. They could either have the combinations of both being in the alpha state, both being in the beta state, and these are going to give us the central peak, or we could have alpha, beta, and beta, alpha, okay? Beta, alpha, and alpha, beta are two distinct states, okay? They each have equal probability 
of occurring as much as alpha alpha or alpha uh, or beta beta. But because alpha beta and beta alpha, these two, these two are the same to the NMR. That is the cumulative shielding to deshielding effect is canceled out. So we go right in the middle. It's as if there was no neighboring hydrogen all there altogether. That is, if one's in the alpha state and one's in the beta state, whichever one is shielding or deshielding is going to cancel the other one out. And so the effect is we're going to just not move anywhere. And there's two possible ways to do that. Alpha over here, beta over here, or beta over here, alpha over here. They just cancel each other out. There's two possibilities. That's going to double that peak integral, if you will. If you actually wanted to, wanted to integrate an individual peak within a signal, you would see that it's twice as high. Now, if we wanted to keep doing this little game, we could with the quartet, and we could show that there's one possibility where we're alpha, 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 beta, and another possibility where we're beta, beta, or excuse me, where we're alpha, one possibility where we're all alpha, one possibility where we're all beta. Then there's three possibilities where we go alpha, 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 beta, beta. Uh, yeah, anyway, so there's, there's all the possibilities uh, for the quartet where n is equal to um, three. Okay, yeah, so it's three. So alpha, 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 beta, 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 and then it's alpha, alpha, beta in three possibilities and then beta, beta, alpha, and three possibilities, one to three to three to one. Okay, anyway, let's go into a big shortcut for determining the multiplet ratios. So the multiplet ratios can be predicted and did I finish this thought up there? Yeah, hopefully I did. It can be predicted with Pascal's triangle. And wouldn't you know, once again, I've not given myself enough room for Pascal's triangle. I think I can do it. So Pascal's triangle is everywhere on the internet, but what you do is you draw a triangle and then we're going to give this different levels. So we're gonna go here. This is going to be the first level. Let's actually make that zero. The zero with a level. And then we're going to have the first level second level, third level, the fourth level, the fifth level, and the sixth level. Okay, so what these levels are is this is n is equal to. So what we need to do in each case is consider splitting our level into the appropriate number of splits to get the multiplet. So the first one is going to be a singlet. We're not going to split that at all. One plus zero is one. And so we're just gonna have one little shape there. And I'm gonna put a one up here. Gosh, that was the worst one I've ever drawn. One, still doesn't look good. Okay, now in the second level, if we take one plus one, that's two. So I'm gonna split this into two parts. And then in three, I get the triplet, four, I get the quartet, five, I get the doublet, triplet, quartet, pentet, five, I get five plus one is the, oops, um, uh, sextet or, or, uh, Hextet, I don't know. People call it either one. It doesn't really bother me. We're never really going to use it. And then the septet, which is seven. No, you don't need to worry about the name sextet or hextet and septet. Okay. So what we have to do for the triplet is divide this piece into three equal parts and then um, four equal parts. I'm not doing a good job, I'll be honest with you. Five equal parts parts and then uh, six equal parts. So then it's just going to be there and there. Uh, and then seven equal parts.
Okay, cool. All right. Now what you do, um, what you do with uh, Pascal's triangle is you kind of, to determine the values, you work from the top and go downward. And so what you do is you add the numbers that are above for each, above each empty space. So if I go to here, all right, above there is a one and that's it. So what I do for each of those spaces is I go to each space and I look at what's above it and I add those numbers of what's above it. So there it's a one <clears throat> in both cases. So it's just a one and a one. Now in the triplet level, above this leftmost block is a one, above the rightmost blo block is a one, but above the middle block is actually two ones. That block is sort of straddling the two ones. So I have to add those together. One plus one is two. Now you can probably see a bit, maybe you get the pattern, but if not, what we can do is we can actually fill the outside of the block with ones because there's always only ever going to be just one above these, okay? Now in the middle two blocks of our quartet, we have a one and a two. So we have to add those together to get a three. Now in the pentet, we've got three blocks. Now second, the second block has a one and a three above it, that's a four but the middle block has a three and a three above it. That's a six, and then a three and a one, that's a four. And then going down to the sextet, we have a one and four gives a five. Four plus six is 10. Um, six plus four is 10. Four plus one is five. And then six, 15, 20, 15, six. So it starts to get really complicated, especially when you go past the pentet. I honestly only have memorized the quartet, triplet, and doublet because it just, I mean, I, if I needed to know, I could just go down to Pascal's triangle. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, consider an example of this. Now, the thing I should, and, and we'll just kind of, yeah, we'll just, we'll just provide a, uh, uh, an example with an OH group, that makes sense. Okay, so first of all, let's figure out the number of signals, the um, integration for the H signals, integrate number of signals, integration for H signals and multiplicity for H signals. And I should specify the one H signals. Okay, so first of all, if we look at the HA, HB, HC, and potentially HD, I would say three or four signals. Honestly, if I was in lab, I would call this three signals. And this is for the 1H spectrum. It also has three signals in the 13C spectrum. It turns out there's no symmetry in this molecule, so we don't have to worry about um, counting the number of carbon signals. I mean, uh, you know, any duplicates. So we just count the number of carbons, and that's the number of signals. Okay, so we have HA, HB, HC. Uh, let's label this whole thing as integration. Actually, let's go signal. I'm going to go um, integration. N value and multiplicity. Where the N value is the neighboring H atoms. And we can make a little table here. And you know what? Professors love to grade organized tables when it comes to data like this, A, B, and C. Okay, so we have 1H signal A, and we can fill in all of these. I may just go ahead and do the integration for all three of them. So A, there's actually three HAs and two HBs and two HCs. I'm not gonna worry about HD. Because, I mean, it's, well, I, I, should, I should worry about it for just this example. I'm going to put a break in my table. Just so you can see, it, it's good of me to, to emphasize that HD probably wouldn't appear 
because it's on an OH and that would wash away. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and just write the answers of what we would expect if we did see it. Okay, so the integration of A is three, B is two, C is two. Not a difficult one in terms of integration. Now for D, that's just one. Okay, no surprise there. Now, what about A, B, and C's neighbors? Well, if you look at A, A is three bonds away from HB and HB is three bonds away from HA, but also HC. So HA has two neighbors, two neighbors. And so its multiplicity is a triplet, which has three peaks. Sorry to draw that kind of small, three peaks. Okay, what about HB. Well, let's come back to HB. Let's skip down to HC. Well, no, no, let's do HB. Okay, HB has three neighbors from HA and two neighbors from HC, so it has five neighbors total. Now, five is above, five plus one is six, so I'm just going to write here six peaks. I don't need to memorize a sextet or a hextet. I, I really don't. Um, I can just write, I expect to see six peaks. Okay, now what about C? Well, the thing about C is also the thing about D. Coupling and splitting do not occur across, oh, um, across non-carbon atoms. Okay, so you're just not going to see it. It's as if HD is not even existing when we count the neighbors for HC. So for HC, I'm going to only consider the two HBs. I'm not going to look at HD. I never look at OHs or NHs or SHs or I don't know, whatever else H, only carbon Hs are the ones that I look at, okay? And it has to be three bonds away. So I don't worry about HA because it's too far away from HC. So what's my N? My N value is actually two. That means I'll see yet another triplet. Now, similarly, my N is equal to zero for D because it's an OH Coupling does not occur, splitting does not occur across the oxygen atom. And so I see zero for my N value. And if I were to ever see that peak be observed in the NMR, most of the time it'll be washed away. If I saw that peak, it would be a singlet because we cannot observe neighbor formation across non-carbon atoms. Okay. This was a pretty long lecture, but it's, and it's, it's by far one of the most complicated aspects of NMR spectroscopy, but it's another one of these things where once you get used to the N plus one rule, once you start to, once you're able to start to quickly see where neighbors are, this will come quickly and will come uh, faster. What I'm gonna do in the next lecture is touch on um, ever so briefly uh, some miscellaneous topics in NMR spectroscopy to sort of wrap us up. Um, and then maybe I should go through, maybe I'll go, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about some examples that I could go through and some problems and that sort of thing. But um, anyway, uh, that'll do it for this lecture.